Dvorak.org slash N-A. Um, I, I feel like we need to continue uh, discussing the net neutrality stuff a little bit, uh, seeing as uh, you, uh, well, you saw how people think about this. Yeah, it's and, just what they think. And the first thing, I, I got a, a pretty cool uh, note. I will admit that I dropped the ball because I was getting some of your messages and I missed the one I should have gotten. I, I was on the Twitch show and we discussed this and, and there was, you know, I was the idiot that, and I, you tell by the chat room, Dvorak is an idiot. Yeah. He doesn't know what he's doing. And the, the, I really missed it because one of the things that I've been arguing about for years uh, is, uh, and I dropped the ball, I admit it, when Leo brought up, he says, well, the internet should be like a utility. Yeah, that should be, and I should dropped be metered. The ball because I have always argued that the internet should be metered. Yeah. And, well, and Leo's always said the internet should never be metered. No, no, no. But now no. here he is. He hands me this. He tosses me this softball, and I yeah, and I you, was just beside myself. You blew it. it, and I was on my deathbed. I, I, I swung and missed. I, I didn't, know. I, I know it's all right. I was on I my. I didn't even swing. The ball went right by. Strike. I was. I was on my deathbed texting you like it's. If, uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, whatever. It's beside the point. Well, um, so our uh, our and we're in agreement on this. Our thesis is. Uh, network neutrality is first of all, it's just a buzzword. Oh man, this there's there's these 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 outfits. Uh, what is this one that I found the other day? Fight for the future. Uh, you should you should. I received an email uh, from Kevin from Fight from the Future. I have no idea how I got on this list. Um, uh, hi, hey, Kevin from Fight for the Future. I noticed you haven't signed this important petition yet. Will you stand up for net neutrality? Last week, FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler announced a proposal for new rules that would allow for a fast lane of internet traffic for content providers. And so we keep on going, this whole thing about how horrible it is, and do you want to support us in the fight for net neutrality? Donate $15 today. That's fightforthefuture.org. And uh, I go looking for who this is. And of course, it's not really an org. Fight for the Future was established in late 2011 under the legal name Center for Rights in Action with seed money from the Media Democracy Fund. Are you with me, John? I'm following you. So, you know, I'm looking up all these different, all these different, and so Center for Rights in Action also doesn't exist. None of these have filed uh, any kinds of paperwork, but it eventually leads back to the Proteus Fund. And the Proteus Fund... Mm -hmm. Uh, throughout our history, Proteus Fund has managed and provided a range of services to family foundation clients. These foundations turn to us because we provide a personalized approach and scope of work tailored to their specific goals and support needs. So the way this works is uh, families, and now we don't know which families because no one has to uh, disclose this on any of this paperwork. They funnel money through the, oh, what is it, the, the Media Democracy Fund, who then give it to the Center for Rights and Action, who then give it to Fight for the Future, which is essentially two people with $100,000 between them to split to go and send emails all day. This, this, this nonprofit work is bogus. And it's very, very annoying because you can't find out who is actually behind this stuff and who is pushing this. But luckily, when John and I take our stance saying, you know, you may not want to be all in on this network neutrality because it may get you exactly what the ISPs want, which is metered service. Um, and I got in a, first, uh, Mike D, one of our producers, he says, Adam, I'm a network engineer, Cisco certified professional. I know about quality of service, traffic, traffic shaping, packet queuing, prioritization. I can explain how to implement them on routers and switches using access lists, traffic classes, policy maps, but I won't. It's boring. Suffice to say, I know a little bit about this stuff. I didn't specialize in this area during my first 15 years in IT, but I can confidently say that most people who don't specialize in it don't understand it at all because I was one of them. Being good with other techie things or knowing how to configure your home router does not even come close. Anybody who would suggest that, quote, all bits should be treated equally is deeply ignorant of networking and should, would be better served to take some classes rather than spouting such nonsense. If I, can, if I continue their stupid analogy about roads, it would be like arguing that all traffic should drive the same speed, whether it's a semi or an ambulance or whether it's through a residential zone or on a highway. It's ignorant nonsense and I don't want to propagate the stupidity. Traffic shaping protocols exist for a reason. They are created to improve the performance of a network, 
Time-sensitive traffic should be prioritized over traffic that is not. Bandwidth hogging traffic should be rate limited and segmented from other traffic so that everything performs better. Failure to do so is negligent and wasteful and increases the amount of congestion. None of these protocols were developed to make someone's experience worse and to suggest that they will is ignorant nonsense. All of these methods are standard practice in a corporate network. If I went to my bosses and insisted that all packets should be treated the same, I would be fired. If our CTO <laughs> instituted a policy of net neutrality and proposed buying more hardware to solve the congestion instead, he would be fired. Anyone who argues that carriers and ISPs should not be allowed to use protocols and best practices of network engineering and traffic shaping should be fired, or at least shut up until they know what they're talking about. Thank you uh, for the long, sorry for the long rant. Thank you for your courage. Now, uh, so this is someone who knows what they're talking about. And by the way, if we're talking about net neutrality, um, why isn't it bi-directional? I don't hear anyone talking about that. If you really want all packets to be equal, why can't I run a server? You don't hear anyone talking about that, do you? They're only, think they're only thinking about their Netflix. That's what the net neutrality Nazis are thinking about, is only the downstream, because you're playing into actually Google's cards, I believe. But Tim Wu is the guy who um, came up with the term net neutrality. And uh, I figured I'd do something completely radical, and I'd pull his original document from 2003, where he said we need net neutrality, and what he said that was. Is that a crazy idea for me to do that, John? Is that's that, nuts. That's, I mean, isn't that just, you wouldn't expect anyone to do that, particularly not a journalist. There is reason to believe that open access alone can be an insufficient remedy for the likely instances of network discrimination. The basic principle behind a network anti-discrimination regime is to give users the right to use non-harmful network attachments or applications and give innovators the corresponding freedom to supply them. On the whole, evidence suggests that the operators often pursue legitimate goals such as price discrimination and bandwidth management. In short, the recent historical record gives good reason to question the efficacy of self-regulation in this area. I'm jumping around the stuff I've highlighted. You'll find it in the show notes. Network neutrality, a shorthand for system of belief about, is a shorthand for system of belief about innovation policy, is the end, while open access and broadband discrimination are the means. You see, if you go through this document, it was just crazy that I did this. He actually says at the end. The, the technical reason IP favors data applications is that it lacks any universal mechanism to offer a quality of service guarantee. IP doesn't care, it runs over everything. Network design is an exercise in trade-offs. True application neutrality may, in fact, sometimes require a close vertical relationship between a broadband operator and the internet service provider. Oh, gee! An internet service provider in this case means the Netflix. Delivering the full range of the full possible range of applications either requires an impractical upgrade of the entire network or some tolerance of close vertical relationships. The guy who came up with net neutrality is advocating this. And he actually advocates metered service. If chat programs have... So here's an example. If chat programs have positive externalities for other network applications, say if a chat program is middleware for a file exchange program, as in the case of Aimster, this is 2003, dependent applications are hurt as well. Second, to the degree other applications depend on a critical mass of high bandwidth users, they are hurt by potential subscribers who, at the margin, are not willing to pay for broadband without the chat programs. Do you see? The only way to have what people call net neutrality is to meter your usage. And we knew 10 years ago, 11 years ago, that video was going to mess it up. And, and you think you get a free ride with your Netflix for $5 a month or whatever, now it's seven, or what, even if it was 10, it doesn't matter. It's a very, very small amount of money. That is going away. You already have this on mobile, but people don't talk about that. You have caps and limits and you can't go over it. This is going to happen to the home, but you're playing into Google's cards and the ISP cards by demanding this net neutrality bullcrap. And, and look at your elect electric bill and your water bill. They are not $50 a month. So everyone who's doing this, you're actually making it worse for yourself 
if it becomes regulated that all packets have to be equal, and the only way for the networks to manage it is by bringing in new hardware and providing more bandwidth, you are going to be paying for it. Goodbye to the days of uh, eat all you want. It's gone. So stop the insanity. <laughs> is that, does that make any sense, John? It's going to make no sense to anybody. Here's um, the national... This is... Uh, you are peeing into the wind. Well, put it in the red... My, do you hear my voice? I'm so shot. Put it in the red book that uh, you're screwed. You are screwing yourself on this. What you really you, are. Putting you're screwed in the red book Just put, is, I've been in the red book. Make a whole page. You're screwed. <laughs> Here is Michael uh, Powell. He is the chairman of the National Cable Television Association. He's uh, Colin Powell's kid, of course. And this is a part from his keynote at the recent uh, NCTA meeting where he, <laughs> he explains why you must be happy that broadband is not a commodity. He does it in a very funny way, though. It's that Internet's essential nature, however, that fuels a very heated policy debate that the network cannot be left in private hands and instead should be regulated as a public utility. Following the example of the interstate highway system, the electric grid, and drinking water. The intuitive appeal of these arguments is understandable, but the potholes visible through your windshield, the shiver you feel in a cold house after a snowstorm knocks out your power, and the water main breaks along your commute should restrain one from embracing the illusory virtues of public utility regulation. The Federal Highway Administration estimates that $170 billion is needed annually just to fix our congested and crumbling roads. Most Americans' drinking water infrastructure is nearing the end of its useful life. There's an estimated 240,000 water main breaks per year, and reports say the water system needs $1 trillion in improvement. America's electric grid is no better. It's suffering and desperately needs a $768 billion shot in the arm by 2020 to keep it from failing. And the number of massive blackouts have increased. That, by the way, was a sound effect he had on stage. In 2007, there were 76... And the lights went off, too. ...major blackouts. In 2011, there were 307... Now, can you imagine if the internet blacked out 300 times a year? No, because it doesn't. Because the internet is not regulated as a public utility, it grows and thrives, watered by private capital and a light regulatory touch. It does not depend on the political process for its growth or the extended droughts of public funding. This is why broadband is the fastest deploying technology in world history, reaching nearly every citizen in our expansive country. Okay, a couple takeaways from this. One, our future is one where everything is shit except we have broadband. Because the toilet's not going to work, no water, the roads are going to fall apart. But we'll have broadband. We'll have, we'll have a house of cards. Two. If this net neutrality bullcrap goes through, which it's going to happen, because you're right, the storm is so huge. People are lobbying for this. But you know who's really behind this? Google. Google. Because they will become the competitor. You, this you can write in the book. I'm from the future, you know. I'm a time traveler. This is why I know this stuff. I'm listening. I'm all ears. People are going to see that their bills are you're going, they're going to triple or quadruple for what you're using with your Netflix and all your porn and everything you like to use and all your YouTube videos. And Google is going to come into every single community with their fiber, and they're going to say, oh, we're going to give it to you for free. We have one package and one package only. Free. But we get to do everything we want with your packets for advertising. They're already making this offer in Austin. Take your, take your Google Fiber. It was well, not free. I think it's one, like you pay once. You pay for the setup. And it's free. And then they get to do deep packet insertion of ads. 
That is what you are doing if you are for this net neutrality bull crap. What you want is you want the smart engineers who really know how to do this stuff to manage the network, try and make the services work. You definitely want, you definitely want Netflix to pay more money uh, to be inside uh, your local provider. And yeah, that will cost you more. whoop de doo But if you, if you choose for the net neutrality route, you're going to get metered service, and the only alternative will be Google, who will be tracking you for everything and will basically own you. Was that an applause? Yeah, uh, applause. Uh, <laughs> that's the best I can do. Yeah, that's, that's where it's headed. That's what's going to that's what's gonna happen. I like it. I think it's a good analysis. I think it's incredibly sad is what I think it is. I think the combination of the, if it wasn't for my clip, I would have given the Michael Powell thing a clip, clip of the day. Uh, I think the Michael Powell clip combined with the uh, letter that we got from our, uh, our producer, mm -hmm. I think summarized it better than anything. It was definitely better than a bunch of people just willy nilly running around, waving their arms in the air while spinning in circles, yeah. and screaming, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Yeah net neutrality we need net neutrality because we're going to be screwed because comcast is going to and the, and the and these imagined scenarios that's why i died on the sh on the show the last it was, it, i saw it happen it was so stupid that you couldn't even you were like you were you couldn't even get into it it was imagined scenarios that are just unlikely but it always goes like this Imagine where you can't watch Twit, or imagine where you can't which, watch Young Turks, or imagine, 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 or when it slows down, or these. Are, this makes no sense. These, these are just. I mean, and they call me a conspiracy theorist. Yeah, yeah, that's the irony. Yeah, and everybody is all in on this. I don't understand it, it's man. Horrible. This. What's going to happen? Well, what's going to happen? Well, this and that and the other thing. And it's. I said that again. Woo! I'm making mistakes today. Wow. But they would go on with uh, their analysis, which was just, just was borderline uh, hallucinatory. But what are you going to do? <coughs> well, I um, mean, you can bitch and moan. You can make your arguments, and you still got. You know, you got powerhouses that are well, the pushing this. Well, the problem is we need more people like Mike D to, you know, jump on, jump in their pens and write something and say, you're wrong. This is not how it works. <laughs> you know, this is not how it works. It's the same. It goes back to your Twitter question. So what do we do when Twitter just basically has to fold? Well, there's a lot of things we could do. A lot. But people don't want to take the effort, don't want to put in the, the, the elbow grease to, to make the network actually, I'm doing it, screw it. I don't, there, there'll be enough people who I care about who will be doing this. Protocols, we've got RSS, we've got all kinds of things that work, perfectly fine. It works. But no, it, it, it's not great for following celebrities. Yeah, okay. So that's a problem.